opportunity to you. It's a great day. Let's so open up the word of prayer. Ask God's blessing of our time together. Father, we love you. Thank you for the joy it is to, to be alive, to serve you, to know that you're our God, and that you're our Savior and our Lord. We pray the Spirit of God would just pour down like you know, rain today on us and you would speak to us. And Father, most of all, whatever you say to us, as I never said, we'll do it. Thank you for this time. We praise you for who you are. In Jesus' name, come on, say. Amen. Amen. Any announcements this morning? We need to share with the body. Uh, prayer group will meet in person for the first time in a year and a half almost on Tuesday, 9 o'clock. Be there, be square. <laughs> uh, the Sunday school group is going to stay online next Sunday, and then we'll probably go to a combination of online and in person that next Sunday, which will be Father's Day Sunday. I just don't know if we're going to start our... Uh, gathering at 9.45 or at 9.30 because we don't have enough time in 10 to 10.30. So, I'll let you know. I think the other announcement, too, is that we're going to, uh, for Father's Day, we're going to start back with coffee time, but we're going to do a special brunch that morning for the fathers in our congregation, and that'll be at 10.30. So, it'll be more than coffee. Do we need to bring anything? Okay. And then look at the mission stuff. For June, we're doing regular size boxes of cereal. So not the great big ones like you get at Sam's or Costco. And then uh, the, instead of doing a monetary collection in June, we're going to do a service project. It'll be at a turning point, which is in Northmore, right, like I-29 and 169. Uh, on Saturday, June 19th, it'll be from 9 to noon. And you're going to uh, help with uh, pa their pantry event. So they'll have clients coming in to get food items from their pantry. You're going to help with that process. And there is a sign-up sheet at the back of the sanctuary so we know how many people can participate. Let's stand together and let's sing, I need the every hour.
excited about and her request that we can take to the Lord as well. Yes, Tracy. Um, my director that we've been praying for that had pancreatic cancer who passed. His services were um, uh, went last Wednesday. So just, you know, prayers for his family. And then um, my dad uh, with the stomach cancer, they don't think that he's strong enough to handle the chemo, so we, he may just, you know, write it out. So, prayers for that as well, please. And the names? Uh, the first one was Victor, yeah. and my dad's George. I want to give my thanks to everyone who made a beautiful blanket for me. I enjoyed it, and I think a few people every time I put, put it out, yeah. I'm afraid of theirs, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We're glad, to We're glad you're here. here.
very present help in time of trouble. I seem to say that a lot, but I'm reminded of that all the time. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And the complexity of all that, Lord, the complexity of each one of these needs, I know that you can meet them because you're greater than all. So we lift up and pray for uh, Victor and his family that uh, and his lost son. Just pray, Father, for the comfort and power of God to be on that family and all those around him. And for George, I pray for healing, touch. I know God, you can do anything. So we're just going to ask, see, and knock until we hear from heaven. So we're going to believe you for the impossible. I thank you that you're the God of the impossible. I thank you for touching this morning. And I pray you touch the whole family there as well. We pray for Patty, Spencer's caregiver, uh, recovering from surgery. It's not going very well, but God, you know what's going on. So I pray that you just step in and a great physician would lay his hand on her this morning, even as we pray. Bring healing to her body. I thank you for doing that. And we do pray for Doug Foster, that's struggling mightily now with COVID, and uh, for his wife Julie. I just pray that healing touch on his life. Give them, give your direct intervention into that family. And Father, bring healing. I thank you for touching this morning. And I thank you, God, that you're greater than Bob's pain, and just pray for him that you'd be with him in a gracious way. And Help him. I know that's debilitating. It's hard to do anything without your back, with your back hurting all the time. So I pray that you just heal him in a great way. I pray that you do a touch in his life. I pray for Chris, the loss of her husband. Just pray that you be with, with her and the folk, family and the friends and you comfort them as only you can. We do pray for Jamie and the whole family there with that body. Pray that the dog, dog body. Pray that you just bring healing not only to their bodies but also to their minds and their spirits. Thank you for being there in a special way. We do pray for Corey. We continue to lift him up, knowing God that you care. And uh, sometimes we think things are going slower than what we want, but we ultimately you're in control. So I just pray, Father, for a quick touch on his life. We bring healing to him in Jesus' name. We also pray for Randy and Missy as they move into uh, Shay's house. I pray that the blessings of God would be all over them in every way. Thank you for all that you're going to do. Now we pray that the prayer of Christ pray together with his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy like kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom.
sing the old right chorus. Tied and the donkeys tied and the tents just as they were. 
gatekeeper called and told it within the king's household. And the king arose in the night and said to the servants, I will tell you what the ravens have done to us. They know that we are hungry, therefore they have done, they've gone from the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, they shall come out of the city, they will capture us alive into the city. One of the servants said, please let some of them take five of the horses which remain and let them and left in the city. Behold, we will be in any case like all the multitudes of Israel was left in the Behold, we will be in one case like any multitudes of Israel that have already perished, so let us go and see. They, they took therefore two chariots with horses and the king sent armies of the Arabians saying, go and see. And after that, the Jordan, they went to the Jordan and behold, all that was full of clothes they equipment that the Arameans had thrown away in their haste, and the messenger returned and told the king. The people went out and gathered the camp of the Arameans. Then a measure of flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Now the king appointed the royal officers on whose hand the leading was in charge of the gates, but the people trampled them on the gates, and he died just as the man of God had said, who had spoken to the king and come down to him. It happened just as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two measures of barley for a shekel and a measure of fine flour. For a shekel will be sold tomorrow at this time at the gates of Samaria. Then the royal officer answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, and such a thing be, he said, Behold, you will see with your own eyes, but you will not eat it. So it happened to him, and the people trampled him at the gate, and he died. That's the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Amen. We're finishing up our series today on the heroes of the faith. There's so many others. That we didn't get to the major prophets, the minor prophets. Remember the Old Testament broken down into five categories: five, twelve, five, five, twelve, five books of the law, twelve books of history, and you got five, five poetic books, five major prophets, and then twelve minor prophets. And uh, so it's just kind of a neat way to break down the Old Testament: five, twelve, five, five, twelve. So if you ever hear Pastor Jerry talk about five, twelve, five, five, twelve, you know he's talking about five books of the law, twelve. Books of history, five poetic books, five major prophets, and twelve minor prophets. Somebody name one of the minor prophets. Anybody? Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi. Or as my attention, friends would say, Malachi. So, if you're Italian, you can call Malachi too. But I love the uh, story of Elijah and Elisha. We talked a little bit about this uh, last week. If you weren't here, let me just kind of recap just within a couple minutes here to share with you what we, what we learned. And uh, you've been, maybe I get you to give your buddy for just a second and you can go pass these out. This is the miracles of Elijah. So you can have those. Elijah means God is Yahweh, my God is Yahweh. Elisha means my God is salvation. They're both appointed by God to both train the sons of the prophets. And they both uh, did extraordinary miracles as a major role in their experience, their physical appearance. Elijah was a hairy man, and Elisha was a bald man. And uh, Elijah was truly a larger than life figure. Elijah's ministry dealt mainly with common people, where Elisha's dealt with Most of Elijah's miracles were dramatic and pronounced judgment, whereas Elisha's ministries were deeds of compassion, much like that of Christ. You need more? I have no more. <laughs> Share <Terrible>. more. <laughs> hey, Miss Anita, I can grab you too, and I, I should have done this beforehand. I apologize. And we can make uh, however many copies we need to make, but this is Elisha's ministry. We talked last week about how they were, Elisha was following Elijah, and uh, he wanted the double portion of God. He asked, said, what, what would you ask before I leave? He said, I asked that God put a double portion of the Spirit upon my life. Double portion is what you would get if you were the inheritance of your Father's will. The firstborn would always get a double portion. So he said, I want to be the heir of what you have. I want a double portion of your Spirit. They went to Gilgal, that place of perpetual cleansing. This is in 2 Kings chapter 2. And from there they went to Bethel, which is 7.44 miles away, walking. 
How many like to walk? Where's my walkers at? Any walkers here? I used to walk. I used to run back in the day, my high school days, cross country, but those days are long gone. My knees just won't quite handle it anymore. And then I went to Jericho, that place of perpetual or incredible miracles. That was 11.557 miles from Bethel, or Bethel. And then they went to Jordan at the desert. It's 120 degrees in the winter in the shade. How many know all temperatures shade temperature? So they tell you it's 90 degrees outside. I want to just tell you, it feels like 125 in the sun. It probably helped me a whole lot better. So they did a grueling, almost 25 mile walk that day. And then he would receive not only his mantle, his spirit, but he also received his God. Three things that Elijah got from Elijah, his mantle, his spirit, and his God. When they got to the Jordan after the chariots came down and separated the two of them, Elijah would allow us to be taken up to heaven by a whirlwind, a tornado, if you will. And uh, his mantle fell down, and Elijah picked, Elisha picked up and says, Where's the Lord God of Elijah? And he smacked the waters, and they parted here and there. He walked across the Jordan on dry, dry ground. He had to learn that day that the God of Elijah was the God of Elisha. Who's a great figure in your life that you look up to? Maybe you look up to years. I looked up for years uh, Billy Graham and John Wesley. And uh, some great men of God that uh, impacted the world's great. But uh, how many of you would like to see God do things that maybe they did that you can do as well? I'd love to see the miracles happen, even that these guys did. We talked about how we prayed for three and a half years it would not rain. And James chapter 5 says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the skies poured forth rain. So how many know just because you didn't get the answer the first time doesn't mean you stop and just go again? When, you, when the servant came back, he said, go up and see if there's any rain coming. We were up on Mount Gilboa, uh, Mount Carmel, excuse me, and saw a cloud. I put my hand up like this. My wife took a picture of me with my hand up like this. A cloud the size of a man's hand was what they were looking for. Six times he came back and said, there is nothing. And he said, go again. Sometimes we feel like there's nothing in God, but there really is. And when sometimes he says, I see the cloud the size of a man's hand. He says, get up, this is my poor. How many of you get excited about a cloud the size of a man's hand that's going to pour? But he saw, he saw what God was going to do. These guys were incredible leaders in faith. He was fed by ravens. He saw the resurrection of the widow's son. He called fire from heaven on, uh, on the altar. And that great prophets of Baal contest that they had. Now this is something you probably wouldn't say. Maybe you've never heard in a sermon before. But the living Bible is really good about the you But Elijah... When he was on the prophets, the prophets of Baal were sitting there cutting themselves and they were calling out to the guy and said, why don't you call a little louder? Maybe he's in the bathroom. That's the living Bible. Maybe he's in the bathroom. He's just relieving himself and he can't hear you. He's mocking them. And uh, he's saying, it's not a real God. You're calling out to him all day long. He took their altar down, put the altar up, got the wood wet, so wet that they filled a trench and it was soaked. And he, he prays to God in a very short prayer, but he prayed to God to answer by fire from heaven. The Bible says fire came from heaven and consumed the altar, the wood, the stones, the rocks, the water, they lifted all up and went back up to heaven. And they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Because he had told them before, he said, the Lord is God, serve him, the Baal is God, serve him, but stop hauling between two opinions. You know, one side of the fence or the other. I mean, you know, it's not fun to stand in the middle of the fence, you're going to get hurt. It's not fun to drive your car in the middle of the road, you're going to die. So we've got to be careful how we do that. So he calls down fire from heaven later on, kills 50 soldiers. They said, if you're, he said, oh man of God, come. He said, if I'm a man of God, and fire come down from heaven, 50 more dies, and finally the third one came and didn't want to ask that again. He parts the Jordan, gives a double portion of the spirit to the lion, shut, and that's where we're at this morning. That was just a nutshell if you weren't here last week or you needed a little refresh. So the first thing he does, he parts the Jordan water, then he heals the water. That was bad in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 21. Some kids come out mocking them and cursing them, the prophet, and he curses them back. And the she bear comes out and kills 42 of them. Fills the valley with water. So the first three out of four miracles had something to do with water. And uh, God blessed in a mighty way there. And then I love the story of the widow that. Her husband had died and he had left behind some dead and they were coming to take his children. This is found in 2 Kings chapter 4. 1 Kings is really about Elijah. 2 Kings is about Elisha. There's a little bit of Elijah in there. 
But the widow's oil says, A certain woman of the wives and sons of the prophets cried out to Elijah and said, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditors have come to take my children to be their slaves. Payment for the, for the debt. Elijah said to her, What shall I do for you? She said, Tell me what you have in your house. He said, Your servant has, your maidservant has nothing in the house except for a jar of oil. How many know the miracle sometimes is in your house? It may seem small and insignificant, and God can't use that. God always uses something that looks small and insignificant. Remember the story of the little boy who gave him Philip? Philip? He said, Let's feed the multitude. He said, There's nobody. Well, there's a lack. He's got five loaves and two fish, but what's that among so many? In other words, big deal. That's not going to do anything. He says, Give it to me. And so the miracle that you have is within your house. So she took that oil and he says, Go and borrow vessels that large from yourself and from all your neighbors. Every empty vessel, and don't get a few. So the woman collected them, began to pour the oil into them, and they filled them all up. And uh, when they had no more vessels to fill, it says there's not one vessel more, the oil, the Bible says in verse 7, stopped. So as soon as we don't have anything more to pour the oil, how many of the oil is the symbol of the Holy Spirit? He wants to fill lives, be poured out into lives. So she came and said to the man of God, go and sell your oil, pay your debt, and you and your sons can live on the rest. He tells the Shunan woman that she's going to have a child, and she has a child. That child has a problem. Something happens that they're out in the field, and he begins to cry out, says, my head, my head, and they bring him back to the house for the man of their house. They built a special house just for the prophet Elisha to come when he was in the earth. And they put him in the bed, and Elisha comes and, and has to raise him from the dead because he passed away. And that's an incredible story, how they stretched himself upon him two times, hand to hand, mouth to mouth, face to face, and he began to get warm, and then the boy sneezed seven times and came alive. And the woman was greatly blessed. The next story we have in the scripture is one of the poison stew, how they were collecting some food, and they found some boards, they looked at where they just chopped them up and into the stew, and then they started eating and said, there's death in the stew. And Elisha took some meal and food in there, mixed it up to serve it to everybody, and everything's fine. They did that, and everyone ate, and everyone was fine. And then the next one is probably the story we're most familiar with, that's the name of the leper. He was the captain of the armies of the kings of Aram, it says in chapter 5, a great man of his masters, and highly respected as by him the Lord had given victory to the Aram. The man was a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. He had that skin disease that nobody wants to talk about. And nobody definitely wants to have it. There's a great song that the Talia sings called Naaman. It was written by Eleanor Wright. And here's what the words say. Naaman the leper went down into the Jordan seven times, and he came up shouting, Lord, I see my change. He had to go down to the Jordan seven times, and he came up shouting, Lord, I see my change. Now, if you don't know what a leper is, let me lend you. I want you to lend me an ear. Open up the pages of your mind, and I will paint a picture there. You see, there were sores on Naaman's body spreading from limb to limb. He had seen many doctors, but there was no hope for him. Till one day, a little servant girl said, Master, good news. I know somebody who knows somebody who knows what to do for you. So she went to the prophet. So he went to the prophet, couldn't believe his, his eyes. When the prophet told him, couldn't believe his ears, excuse me. The prophet said to him, dip into the water of the bunny Jordan down here. And he had to go down to the Jordan seven times, and he came up shouting, Lord, I see my change. So he went down in the waters one time, and then again, began to wonder as they looked down at his hands. See, there were plenty of rivers in his homeland where the waters were crystal clear. He wondered why the prophet bring him way down here. He went down for the fourth time, and finally started to go back home. Then a voice called out to him, Naaman, hold on. There's no power in the water, Naaman. Not in the muddy stream. You see, the power comes from doing what God says. And so he had to go down to the Jordan seven times, and he came and shouted, Lord, I see my change. And here's the last verse. It says, So he went down the fifth time, the body still covered with swords, seemed like the muddy water made the pain a whole lot more. Six times in the Jordan, six times, so strange. Six times he looked at himself, six times, no change. Oh, I know he must have thought way back in his mind, he'd be free from the dread of this disease without dipping seven times. Well, I know he must have doubted what God's prom that God's promise could be true. You see, Naaman had to learn one. God wants seven. Six won't do. He had to go down into Jordan seven times, and he came up shouting, 
Lord, I see my change. The scripture says when he came up out of the water, his skin was like a baby. And uh, he said, that's what's going to happen to you. And he began to see God do some great things. The servant got greedy over a gift that he tried to give to Elisha. And the leprosy that was on Naaman came on his servant Gehazi. And he had it because of his greed. And then they had it, they were cutting some trees down, and their axe head fell into the water. So they said, That's borrowed, Master. I don't know what to do. He took a stick and threw the water, and the axe head floated. How many of you know how heavy an axe head is? It's pretty heavy. How many of the iron doesn't float, except for we made a, for one of the kids' terms, we made the uh, paper clip float. But not, it wasn't a, I wouldn't try that with an axe head. And if a guy made that happen to him, then probably one of my favorite stories is the one of the king of Aram was warring against Israel. This is in chapter 6, verse 8. And he counseled with the servant, saying, In such and such a place we shall, shall be in my camp. The men of God sent word to the king of Israel, saying, Behold, would you don't pass this way, the Arameans are coming down there. The king of Israel sent that place, and the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was guarding himself there more than once or twice. And the heart of the king of Aram was enraged over this thing. He called his servants and said to them, Why? Who's telling them? Uh, which one of you is for the king of Israel? It says, no, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the kings of Israel the words that you are speaking in your bedroom. You're saying things in secret, and the man of God is hearing it and telling them not to go that way. So they sent armed horses and chariots to find Elijah. Horses, chariots, and a great army. And they came by night and surrounded the city to capture one man. Anybody think that's a little bit that's excessive? When they come and find the day, we're going to bring the entire army, all the horses and chariots for one man. And uh, but there's a powerful man that they came upon, and they had to realize that, that if they're going to take him, they're going to have to do it that way. And the servant got up in the middle of the night and saw them, saw them circling the city. He said, "Alas, my master, what shall we do?" He says, "Don't fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them." Do you realize this morning that God is more for you than the world is? Bob says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world in first John. And uh, that is so true. And uh, God that is with you is greater than all the armies and all the enemy that could ever put anything against you. And then he prays to this, the Lord. He says, oh Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. The Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw. And behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire all around Eli. Shut. So they had the armies of Arabians around them, but they, they saw the armies of God around him. And then he prays that God would strike the people with blindness. Strike this people with blindness, I pray. Seven word prayer. And strike the entire army with blindness. He leads them into Samaria. And uh, then he prays again. He says uh, that his, their eyes will be open. Their eyes will open in the right middle of the city. And the king of Israel says, show them guilt. He says, no, give them something to eat and send them all. And they never came back again. And how many of the Bible says, if your enemy is hungry, what are we supposed to do? Eat. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And they never came back and did that again. And then just uh, a couple more here, and we'll, then we'll stop this morning. So that's one of my favorite stories that Elijah did. The end of the famine, we talked about that story in chapter 7. <coughs> this is a great story about these four leopard men. How many know God uses the young? The, uh, sometimes the ones we would never expect him to use. I think of a man by the name of David Ring. David Ring has cerebral palsy. He's a great uh, Southern Baptist evangelist. And uh, he talks with great difficulty. Yet God uses this man to lead thousands, probably tens of thousands of people to Christ because of his dedication to God. And uh, he remembers when his mom was dying and, and uh, mourning the loss of his mother. And his mother told him everything was going to be all right. That God was going to take care of him. So God uses a man with cerebral palsy, blesses him with a beautiful wife, and they have four or five kids, and he's reaching the world in Christ in his, in his way. So sometimes God uses people that we would never think he would. I think of Johnny Erickson Tata, who as a teenager dove into a pond and didn't realize it wasn't very deep, and she broke her neck, paralyzed from the neck down. And that woman can sing. She said, it takes everything within her to sing because she can't feel her diaphragm to push off the notes. She has albums out where she sings. She can't draw with her hands, but she can put a pen in her mouth and she makes the most beautiful drawings you've ever seen in your life with her mouth. I'm feeling pretty bad right 
that sign. You know, because I have a hard time drawing a stick man that you probably recognize as a stick person, but uh, she can make the most beautiful drawings. It's realize that God sometimes will take something that we would think he would never use and use that greatly for his kingdom. And that's what I love about him so much. So he takes these four lepers men and they're sitting at the gates and famine is coming upon the city and they're going to die. And they says, why don't we sit here until we die? Verse 3. He says, if we say we'll enter the city and famine is in the city, we'll die there. But if we stay here, we're going to die also. Let's go to the camp of the Ravens. If the spirits we will live, if they kill us, we will but die. So they trip them to the camp and they get there and the horses are tied up, the dogs are tied up, there ain't nobody there. So they go to one tent, grab all the silver, the gold, the clothes, and go hide them, come to another one, do the same thing, and the grave would be healed. You know? I think this would be awesome. Uh, I heard a story just recently of a lady that the woman in the back of her tomb, so she put her recipe to her fudge that she was real popular making. So if you get at her tomb and put on the back of her tomb, so it would be her, her fudge recipe that she was very famous for. So hopefully yours will say something that's very powerful, something that's life-changing, something that's not just going to fill the belly up and taste good. Again, this is the day of good news. Can't keep silent. i got to tell somebody. And that's really what it's all about. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these great men of God that walked in faith. They trusted you. They knew who you were. They knew that you were a great God and that you were rewarded for those who diligently seek you. They were men of prayer. They were men and women of prayer. Sought your face. Who believed you against all odds. And when everything said there was nothing, go again. We're going to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking until we hear from heaven. Matthew 7 7. So I pray, Father, you would let faith arise within us. I pray you put a double portion of your spirit, like you put on Elisha, upon us as well. And Father, we be that inheritance of the greatest thing that God has given us the spirit. His son within our hearts. So I pray, Father, you would do that incredible work in us and help us not to be silent. This is a day of good news. It makes me feel like it's a day of great news. It's the greatest news I've ever heard in my life. It's the best news I've ever heard. So I pray, Father, we would not be silent and have our own private party dying. We're going to die without it. Help us, Lord, to touch those that are in desperate need of you. We praise you for who you are. We thank you for your faithfulness and your love. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people said. Amen. Mm -hmm.